Uh, I'm at, in Sweden. Uh, Electron is an Israeli company, uh, founded in 2013. Uh, here you see the location of the company, close to the beach. We don't have the beach in, in Sweden, unfortunately, but we work very close uh, and we work on a topic called electric road systems. So it will be a pleasure to introduce this to you. Um, so I, I guess everybody knows uh, that um, during these times with, with, with Corona, uh, that there is no really other option to go to electromobility to clean up the air. And we see government after government taking measurements to actually enforce regulations to go to zero emission vehicles. And I think the one thing that we have uh, identified or that is uh, considered as a constraint is the battery. Uh, that for commercial vehicles, especially if you have a big fleet, you'll have uh, a lot of battery and batteries that would wait in a bus or in a truck uh, that would give you range limitation that, that affects your operations. You need to have a charging infrastructure, which is separate um, to, the, to the location um, with low utilization. You'll have a long charging time and you have a lot of different vehicles charging at the same time at the grid. So this is one, one of the constraints. And then imagine if you would electrify a city, uh, such as Paris or New York, or, or I mean, you'll have a lot of uh, vehicles, right? Both private and commercial ones that needs uh, a lot of different, I mean, huge size of batteries, uh, separate in infrastructure. You have to place them somewhere, which is a hassle. Uh, so I think going wireless is, is, uh, is the real option here. Um, so what we are doing, maybe it's a bit different to, to others, but we are uh, creating a platform which would be shared between all different vehicle types. So you can charge while driving, uh, enabling the, yeah, a, a smart uh, solution that could also be future-proof with uh, autonomous vehicles that can then run you know, 24 seven uh, with, uh, with minimal batteries. So I think this is, this is what, what we are offering and, and the value proposition is really to go to increase the market uptake of zero emission vehicles. Because if you have this shared vehicle or this shared charging infrastructure and you make vehicles more commercially viable uh, or more cost efficient, we think that this would be a way to increase and complement uh, even other, uh, other initiatives, or other technologies that are out there. Uh, so what an electric road system does is that it, it it's gives you continuous charging, so it prolongs the battery lifetime. Uh, it improves the efficiency of the operations because you don't need to uh, stop and charge. Um, and given that we can then reduce the size of the battery and the weight of it, you can, uh, I mean, you get a better, higher energy efficiency of the vehicle. Uh, and you also get can get more cargo capacity and passenger um, in, in a bus, for example. Uh, our system is, it consists of three main, uh, let's say, subsystems. So you have a, uh, a management unit, which will be uh, besides of the road. You'll have coils underneath the road, and then you'll have a receiver uh, underneath the vehicle. Now, the, the coils, they are uh, passive. So they are only activated when um, a receiver is above it. So each coil has its separate, um, uh, separate connection. Uh, the, the smartness of the system, the communication is placed in the management unit. So there you have the, the communication, the, the electronics, uh, which you would then would maintain. And the coils are, um, they don't require any maintenance. You can redo, repave the road without touching or hurting the coils. Uh, and when you come above a coil, like 20% 20, 20, um, of it, it enlightens, it turns on, then you pass it, and then it turns off. So there is already a um, active safety system and access control uh, for, for uh, ID'd, let's say, vehicles. Um, and there is a smartness of the system, which allows us to have a energy metering, uh, to know exactly what vehicle consumes at what uh, point of given time. Uh, we can also create the interface to uh, utilities so that they can then bill you know, uh, users. So it's it's similar to a mobile phone uh, or telecom uh, uh, business model. So you can actually, as the driver, as a consumer, you can choose whatever utility you want uh, and still charge on the road. Um, 
And I think what, another additional feature that we can do is that we can balance the grid by prioritizing uh, the vehicles that need charging the most. So in this case, you will see a bus with a, a low stock. We will we can prioritize this one and shut off a couple of the receivers of a truck. Uh, for example, uh, we can also integrate it easily with a microgrid if you have energy storage at the grid uh, to minimize the upfront investment that you need to make in 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 the grid, which is uh, which could be. Uh, you know, very time consuming in the beginning and you might not have as many vehicles to start with. So we can, we can have these kind of smart solutions uh, as well. Um, now, why exactly wireless uh, dynamic charging? I think I, I, I've mentioned these, these issues that it could be, uh, of course, shared between all types of vehicles. So heavy duty, uh, light vehicles, uh, vans, um, you don't have any moving part. I think this is the beauty of it. So it's very good for, uh, from a maintenance perspective and cost issue. Uh, and also you don't have any visual impact. So we don't need any additional you know, real estate uh, uh, or hassles that, that are made of these um, technologies. So I think in essence, what we offer to a uh, commercial fleet, uh, which would be you know, to go to market as they, ha they probably have the, um, uh, the highest hurdle going to zero emission or going electric uh, is that instead of investing in your own infrastructure in your, on your own site, uh, instead of uh, you know, buying these huge batteries, we, you can save on the charging infrastructure on the upfront cost, you save on the batteries, uh, in getting increased efficiency, um, increasing range and operational performance. So, I mean, typically what we do is that you find these kind of corridors uh, and then you can combine this electric road system on the corridor with a static or semi-dynamic application if that's needed to create a, a holistic business case for, for the users. And I'll just show you this picture to the bottom right. You have the receiver. So it's about three centimeters, 3.5 centimeters. And it's a really nice interface as we only have uh, two plugs. So one is for communication, one is for energy. Uh, it's really easy to integrate to a vehicle. Um, each one receives about 25 to 30 kilowatt. So what we would do is that we, the system in modular, so you'll add uh, the number of receivers depending on the power demand of the vehicle type. So passion car would have one, uh, a van two, a bus three, and a truck maybe five. Um, here you can see uh, our truck in, in Gotland, which we have, uh, where you see the receivers in, in the bottom on, on, underneath the trailer. Um, so I'll share with you uh, our project in Sweden, which is called Smarter Gotland. It's the first one uh, for a bus and a truck on the public road. Uh, and we installed uh, 50 meters before uh, the coronavirus in November. Now, hopefully after summer, we will do 1.6 kilometer, where we'll have the shuttle on the bus. So I'll share with you a video of how we deploy and how you deploy our technology. I hope that it's showing with you. So we have a grid connection to start with. You open the road, about 10 centimeters, you put the coils. Really easy, you see everyone has its own connection. And then you put asphalt. So basically, the installation is quite easy. I mean, we, we do it with normal type of equipment uh, and uh, you can do it overnight. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's simple in that sense. Uh, the coils that are implemented are durable, as, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, and, and could be used for all types of vehicles. So I think we also have um, several other projects. This one is the other let's say sibling project that we have on the public road that we're going to construct after summer as well in Tel Aviv. It's a shuttle between uh, the university and the train station. 
Um, so the idea that we have is really that, I mean, you have the roads uh, already, uh, so why not use them as uh, for charging uh, while you drive? So uh, driving time is charging time in that sense. So um, the idea is that you turn the road from an expense to an asset for the road owner and, and for fleet operators. Uh, and we typically have two, let's say, business cases that we go for. Either you have a city where you have a base user as buses. Uh, and then if we know where the buses go, uh, you can you know, calculate on what stretches do we need a dynamic stretch. Uh, and of course, then also could combine that with a static one to make it more holistic. If you, do, if you have buses go far away from the electric road where it's not, uh, no sense to deploy the electric road because you don't have traffic. And then when you have the electric road, we can add users by uh, putting, you know, giving access to fleet uh, delivery trucks, uh, shuttles, taxis, uh, and so on. And similar to, let's say, highways, uh, as you, you have a base, a base user of a long haul or graded trucks, uh, we know how they uh, move, how they, uh, how they um, uh, operate. And then when you've built it, you have a business case for it, you can add user uh, as you go on. In that sense, you have this kind of shared platform, as I, as I mentioned, that could be utilized and shared between different users. Uh, and it's also really an opt optimal kind of synergy with, um, with other types of uh, technologies. So you can use it, uh, even if you have a fuel cell, you can still use it you know, use your fuel as a range extender to, to move uh, where you don't have an electric road or biofuels or other types of technology. So it's really, um, it's really complementary in that sense. I'll just show you here how we typically do it. So here have the case in, in Tel Aviv where we have, we're going to deploy, you have three bus lines. You have the red, blue, and dark blue. So then you can calculate. So in this case, I think, if the buses go about 40 to 50 percent on our uh, system and then they still have the battery then you can calculate how much you reduce the battery in terms of kilowatt hours so from a 350 kilowatt hours to 40 kilowatt and then you reduce the size the kilo the 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 weight of the battery right so you make it uh, much more uh, cost efficient um, and then you can calculate how much you save for the, the bus operator and actually how much more let's say vehicles you can deploy if you are an OEM uh, and how fa much faster you can reach the, the zero emission targets. Uh, we have I mentioned Israel, uh, Tel Aviv now, I mentioned Sweden where we have a pilot so our project is funded by the, the road administration in Sweden. Uh, they are buying knowledge from us so we're doing the demonstration so that they can choose between different electric road system technologies where the next stage is to build a uh, commercial pilot for uh, 25 to 30 kilo, uh, kilometer. We also have projects uh, in a pipeline in, in Germany, or Germany is also exploring wireless uh, electric road system, Italy as well, and we see huge demand in California, which it just has passed a zero emission truck um, initiative. So it's really, and what we see is many people come to us or cities or uh, actors come to us for these kind of solutions that are finding it a bit tricky going electric with the conventional um, methods. Um, so basically what we are to achieve our goals, we can't uh, work alone. So we need to work with other partners. So if you're in the audience and you're, you know, you feel this is intriguing and you want to work, I think we, need to create a partnership in collaboration with governments and cities, with users, uh, the fleet operators or transport buyers, with the grid uh, uh, operators, the utilities, of course, road construction companies and OEMs. So we're happy to discuss um, in, in those projects that we have because we think that this could be uh, a very nice way to go to zero emission in a, in a cost efficient way and in a way that reduces uh, emissions the, uh, the most. So I'll thank you and, and leave the floor open to, to some questions. Thank you, Stefan. Um, very nice insights on, on the infrastructure side. Um, we indeed have some questions popping up and I will um, go a bit through them. We have two similar questions. Um, it's about the cost and maintenance of the roads. Um, the other question was what about road surface maintenance operations? So they're quite similar. Any idea about this? Yeah, so the, the, 
what we do is that we mill 10 centimeters and our coils are about two centimeters. Uh, and then we put eight centimeters of asphalt. Now, when you redo the road, you, ha you have a top layer about 3.5 centimeters between three and four. So you can redo the road, I mean the top layer, and put new asphalt without you know, hurting the, um, or touching the coils. Uh, so in that sense, we have a very long lifetime on the road surface, so we don't need to uh, maintain that. Uh, and we don't anticipate either, uh, we have put them in a road, in, in the most busy road in Tel Aviv for over five years, and there's no, been no degradation on either the road or the coils. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um, do you transfer the electricity direct into the battery or is there a supercapacitor in between? Uh, interesting question. I think in the, um, in the bus in Sweden, we have a super cup and uh, in the truck, we have a battery. So, for, uh, so we, typically we, we charge directly in the battery uh, or, or um, yeah. So we can we can use different we can use with different uh, technologies let's say and we can also directly to the engine depends on what the vehicle tells us we we, we work with the BMS so in that sense okay so there is not one solution in, in this case we are we are no we are flexible yeah um, question about um, how much power do you need to supply per lane per kilometer or per road um so depends on how many trucks so our our worst case scenario each let's say each hundred meter we have one uh, management unit and what uh, per kilometer we have a, a substation a grid connection so it depends on how many trucks you have on the road so let's say you have a, a three trucks on a, on a hundred meter stretch and each receives 125 uh, kilowatt, uh, we don't have any limitation in delivering that power from the management unit or the, it's an optimization point of view. Uh, the only issue is that you then need a strong uh, uh, or heavy a grid connection. So we can supply it to a queue situation where you need, you know, we can up, um, upgrade the system, have a bit more cooling then, uh, and we can do it. So it's, for us, it's no limitation from our point of view. Um, we are. We can design that uh, depending on the use case. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, a last question, um, and then maybe we can see if we can answer the rest um, on directly. Um, what's the likely comparison on raw material um, when significant in road charging is deployed versus larger batteries and conductive or wireless charging at fixed locations? Um, yeah, it's it's a good question. So uh, I think we still we are going to do this. We are doing that kind of analysis now in our in our project, and we haven't had the end result. But I think what's I think the the answer would I mean the preliminary answer is of course that if you have a road with a high percentage of trucks or vehicles, and each so you build the road once, uh, and it could be utilized for all vehicles with reduced you know raw, raw materials. Uh, so I think there is a threshold there, and uh, I'm happy to share that as soon as we have a answer. Uh, okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, so if people have more questions, they certainly can reach out or connect you yeah. directly. I have um, a meeting on the slide there, if you see that. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I'm now happy to introduce our next speaker. Diego, welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. So you please to take over the screen. Is it? Yes, perfectly. Floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diego Garcia Carvajal. 
And I work uh, at the European Copper Institute, uh, mainly focused on the promotion of uh, electromobility. And ECI is uh, the regional office uh, of the Copper Alliance, that is the global association of copper producers, and I mean producers, miners, refiners, and, and fabricators. One of our missions is to promote uh, copper applications, basically through uh, working on regulations and standards. We are not directly part of, uh, of the market. And why electric vehicles? Uh, because on average, a passenger car currently uses three times more copper than a conventional vehicle. Half or around half of that uh, amount is in the battery. This is the average uh, density use of uh, batteries, current batteries, battery pack. And uh, to that amount of copper, we need to add also the, the copper use in the charging infrastructure and in the uh, renewable generation to feed the vehicles. So that's the reason. But the uh, battery electric vehicles are not only good for the copper industry, are also very good for the society. And basically, because it's a, a powerful solution in order to, to mitigate the, the climate emergency that we are already are. Uh, first, because road transport uh, has the highest uh, decarbonization potential of, uh, of the sectors in the economy. Uh, in Europe, uh, um, road transport accounts for 20% of emissions. Uh, the battery electric vehicles emit uh, from well to wheel, no? with uh, data of uh, 2015 three times less than uh, combustion uh, vehicles. And another important uh, factor is the, the high rotation rate of uh, uh, road transport vehicles compared, for example, with uh, heating and cooling equipment. The average in Europe is uh, the, the, the duration of ownership is six years. And, and the rotation rate uh, in heat and cooling is between three and four times that amount of years. And um, in addition to uh, the advantage of uh, decarbonization and, and improved air quality in cities mainly, is uh, what makes, uh, what is, uh, um, what makes, yes, battery electric vehicles, the, 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 the best available technology, basically three things. One is energy efficiency, compared with other clean technologies, battery electric vehicles is between 2.5 and five times more energy efficient. Um, also um, with the current development of, uh, of the batteries, um, the total cost of ownership is already lower in most of the cases, in most of the European countries and, and models below the, the conventional equivalent. And finally, because the battery electric vehicle has the capability to to provide grid services and to integrate a renewable generation. What is the typical use case that we see uh, with uh, passenger cars mainly? Uh, the last models, middle satellite models, uh, have a, a range of 400 kilometers, more than enough for every day use. And the, the, the only need in order to replenish the energy is just with 3.7 kilowatts in less than three hours on average in Europe. Uh, you can, you can uh, replenish the energy using during the day. So basically this is more than 90% of the, of the time around the, the place of residence. With uh, a high renewable mix, so higher than, than today in most of the, of the countries, our vision is um, to keep uh, the, the car always uh, connected. Basically in the long term, uh, to have a, a connection point in every parking space just to to, re, to be ready, uh, the, the vehicle to, to charge, to take or provide electricity anytime. Um, another important uh, factor is the, the appearance of new actors called a mobility service provider or the equivalent one from the energy side, is the aggregator, that they will manage the, the state of charge of the battery and uh, the, the user uh, won't need to think uh, really to to think about the, the charging, if I need to charge, uh, how much to charge, uh, price, etc. And uh, probably they, this, these two actors, uh, they are going to use uh, artificial intelligence and also if the, if the owner uh, authorizes uh, the use of personal data, for example, to, to charge in advance if it, there is a long journey in, in the plan. Finally, um, 
for long journeys is uh, is required a minimal high power infrastructure at least uh, 150 kilowatts uh, in order to to make uh, shorter the the waiting time and again to charge uh, at low power at destination okay so once the co2 standard regulation that is the more relevant one uh, regarding in order, in order to promote or to to accelerate this transition is in place and now that the fabricators the oems are working uh, hard in in order to to provide models the, now is the turn to convince uh, consumers because at the end uh, it's uh, and 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 a, and a key uh, element to convince consumers is to to make electric vehicles more convenient to use than uh, conventional ones or even to uh, really uh, that uh, allow consumers to forget uh, about the charging. So our main uh, policy as uh, regarding the European regulation is uh, for long journeys, what I mentioned, this minimal high power infrastructure in order to, to really unlock the sales of EVs. Uh, second one is for um, in cities for people with uh, off street uh, parking space in, in shared buildings, typical residential buildings, is the right to plug that uh, that's uh, that's mean that means uh, that uh, only to uh, ask for um, sorry only to send a communication a prior communication to the community a unique requirement in order to install uh, a charging point and last uh, for uh, parking on the street uh, people without uh, off street parking uh, what we are uh, promoting are tenders uh, to be granted uh, before uh, 2025 for at least 20% of the public uh, parking spaces in cities. And also uh, with uh, wireless charging. Uh, that's the link. Why wireless? Uh, first, this um, public parking spaces, basically two thirds of the vehicles, uh, they park overnight on the street or in public uh, car parks. And um, cities uh, will prefer, is, is, is our view, will prefer an invisible charging infrastructure. No? The, the previous speaker mentioned that wireless has the advantage of, of the, um, the, the installation is the equipment is underground. And secondly, it's, it's all very interesting for drivers because uh, they, they will um, really forget about charging. Basically, uh, forget about, I mean, the cables, I mean, applications or tokens to, to, to start the charging, and even, uh, yes, to, to forget about the charging itself. Basically, the, the typical procedure, the steps are explained there. Uh, the driver parks and aligns, some vehicles will do by, by themselves. The vehicle and the charging infrastructure uh, start communication and will finish once uh, the, the charge is, is finished or when the, the, the user comes back to the, to the vehicle. And in case of a uh, living object or a foreign object, uh, the, the charging is going to stop and send a message. And also, while charging is uh, very suitable for car sharing and autonomous vehicles. So it's aligned with the evolution of uh, vehicles. Um, water charging is, is ready. What we are um, asking for is uh, at least 7.4 kilowatts because 3.7 is the average passenger car, but for light commercial vehicles or heavy users is, is needed more power, but 7.4 is within is enough. And the efficiency between the, the electricity uh, taken by the charge point and the, and the electricity supply to the battery is the same in wireless system than conductive system uh, already in the market. The cost of the additional equipment in order to, to, to make a, a vehicle um, wireless, no, with like charging or also a charge joint is relatively low. It's 500 euros in the case of vehicle and around 2000 euros for, a, for every charge point. Um, Wireless is already included in, in, in vehicle uh, in vehicle platforms of, of major major OEMs. Also, is available the retrofit uh, of uh, vehicles and, and char points in order to include or to add this wireless equipment. And last, uh, vehicle to grid is also available and possible with wireless. And, and regarding the standards. Um, uh, 
China, China just published several weeks ago, just published the, the standards uh, regarding wireless charging. US is going to, to publish the new version of the J2094 uh, within this year. And in Europe, I, I include this summary of all the standards related with wireless in, in Europe. And in mid-21, they are going to be ready, all of them. So what is the what is, what is our strategy? Uh, basically, my my conclusion from different conversation with uh, car manufacturers or reading material is that uh, we think that the car manufacturers are thinking on wireless as a premium optional for for yeah, premium customers. Also, uh, thinking of commercial fleets no? using wireless in in the private uh, in private charging infrastructure. That, however, uh, we think that the uh, wireless has a uh, a big potential in order to, to promote uh, battery electric vehicles among the consumers in general. And in our view, cities uh, are the ones that have the key, have the key to, to unlock uh, water charging, the deployment of water charging, because from the car manufacturer or the, or the charge points operator is a kind of chicken and egg problem, who is going to start uh, deploying wireless, but the, if cities are convinced that the wireless is something good for cities and good for citizens, and they uh, require wireless in future changes, I think this is the way to synchronize the market. So the steps is um, keep on running pilots uh, to confirm the promise of uh, wireless charging in cities, then share uh, that cities, no, among cities, share the, those experiences, uh, their experiences, and finally to, as I said, to include uh, wireless charging in, in future tenders, maybe we, before 2025. About the, the pilots, pilots are already in progress. Uh, about the pilots, I, 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 I'm aware of. Um, the first one was Rotterdam in four years ago as a technology test. But in, in the last 12 months, there are another four uh, pilots running, three of them in uh, regarding uh, fleets, uh, taxi runs in, in particular, but in London, uh, also in, in residential parking, that the, for us is, is very interesting because it's, it shares this, uh, this, this pilot shares the same view as, as we have, no? that is wireless is interesting for, for consumers. Currently, uh, I'm looking for more cities interested in on running wireless charging pilots. So if uh, you, you are working in one city, municipality interested in wireless, or uh, you are aware of some interest from some cities, please uh, send me an email. You have the address here. Okay, that's, that's all for me. Thank you, Diego. Um... Good to have the point of view of uh, your organization. Um, we have a few questions coming up here. Um, let me allow to address them to you. So efficiency will surely be more impacted on inductive systems when controlled smart charging is required. What strategies are planned to mitigate this? Efficiency, the, the efficiency of, uh, of uh, wireless systems are in, in the same range that the conductive systems. So I don't see any problems uh, regarding this, this aspect of wireless. Okay, yeah. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you state that uh, battery electric vehicles are two and a half to five times more energy efficient than any alternative solutions. Yeah. Person has had doubts to believe this. I have the feeling. Okay. Um, in order not to make long the, the answer, um, uh, please uh, send me the, 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 the email and I will, or even I, I, I can sh uh, share with you the, the reference uh, of this uh, statement in order that you can share with all the participants. Please inspect that way. All right. No problem. Of course, feel free. Um, also, we've, we have study work on, on efficient efficiency um, on our website from Avere. There is a debunk page with all yeah, the coming up myths um, and feel free to consult them. There you find quite some academic study work about efficiency 
So um, certainly feel free to, to consult this. Thank you, Diego. Um, I appreciate your efforts here. And I'm okay. pleased to announce the next speaker, David Scott. I hope I pronounce it well. David, you feel yes, so I'm here on the screen. Yeah. And presentation modes. Yeah. Indeed. So I understood it's 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 afternoon for us in, in Europe, so right? you located in, in the US. That's correct. Um, our company is headquartered in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And um, yeah, so it's uh, 930 in the morning, but good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak to this uh, webinar. We hope everybody is uh, safe and uh, productive in this unprecedented uh, time in which we're living. But I think this uh, webinar is a good opportunity. And in fact, Diego's presentation, I think, was a great introduction to, uh, for, for me, uh, because our company was founded in order to realize the, the dream that, uh, that he's described. Uh, he called it uh, a park and forget. Uh, for me, park and forget often means I forgot where I parked. <laughs> but in this case, I think we talk about park and charge. So the idea is that the entire experience of charging your vehicle should be quite uh, invisible to the user. I'll also be able to perhaps address some of the questions about efficiency and other things about the core technology. Um, so our vision uh, is exactly as Diego described, that uh, vehicles, whether they're passenger vehicles or larger vehicles, um, should be able to pull into a parking spot uh, either with a driver or autonomously and uh, begin charging and complete the charge cycle with uh, no intervention, no charging cables, no connect, physical connection to the car. And um, I think everybody understands the appeal of this, both in terms of convenience, in terms of preventing vandalism, um, and perhaps even in terms of safety uh, of handling these high voltage charging cables and bad weather conditions and so on. So our business is very, very focused on what uh, we would call in this case today static charging, um, meaning that charging when the vehicle is being parked and not in use. Um, the applications extend uh, quite broadly uh, what we call touch-free wireless charging. Um, obviously, passenger vehicles, we're starting to see now development of um, uh, electric uh, people movers, sometimes autonomous, sometimes still with a human driver and semi-autonomous. Uh, personal mobi mobility vehicles like scooters and e-bikes uh, charging is a critical issue in the business model associated with, with these kinds of vehicles. Uh, during our COVID crisis, the whole topic of uh, delivery of uh, food and other products uh, to the uh, consumer's home or apartment is stimulating a lot more interest in autonomous delivery vehicles. And then even inside warehousing and retail establishments, um, wireless charging, similar to that which is used on uh, uh, road vehicles, can be applied to different kinds of robotic systems and automatic guided vehicles. Whitricity's business spans this full range of mobility solutions. Um, and what we're talking about is not necessarily just a future technology. I'm going to show you a video from BMW show how real this technology is.
transfers the energy to the high voltage battery pack a completely empty battery David? is fully loaded within three yes and can, a half can hours. i just interfere um, in the beginning the sound right. was the sound was really bad so maybe we can start over again okay um yeah we didn't in the beginning we didn't couldn't understand what the person was saying so um if you maybe mute your camera then we use less Okay, I'll mute, I'll mute my, I'll do this and try muting my. No, um, David, you don't mute the microphone, but cut off the camera, because now we don't hear anything. Apologies for this technical. David, you have to start over again. And this is how it works. The primary coil in the wireless charging station generates an electromagnetic field. The secondary coil in the car then transfers the energy to the high voltage battery pack. A completely empty battery is fully reloaded within three and a half hours. BMW Wireless Charging makes charging easier and refueling. So that the, the actually the last uh, comment made on the video, and hopefully the sound problem. Uh, hopefully the sound problem went away, um, really says it all that driving an electric car should be, uh, and owning an electric car should be easier and better in every dimension than an internal combustion engine vehicle. And why, so why did BMW invest so much in this technology, work so many years to bring it together? Um, that's really because um, consumers do want this convenience, don't want to have to be bothered by plugging in a vehicle. Many early adopters of electric vehicles would say, well, they're quite proud to plug in a vehicle. But when we talk about the mainstream market, which is where e-mobility must succeed in order to, to really make a dent in carbon emissions, um, consumers don't want to be bothered with the charging cable. And wireless charging is a very good solution to that problem. In fact, um, this study by JD Power in Germany shows just how strongly consumers would prefer vehicles that could charge themselves. Now, the question is, how is it done? Um, so Wytricity, as a company, we were founded uh, by a team of physicists from MIT in uh, 2007 to commercialize a technology invented at Wytricity, which they called highly resonant wireless power transfer, based on a, a technical insight uh, that was patented at, uh, by MIT of how to make systems operate uh, very efficiently over what we call mid-range distances of up to tens of centimeters of uh, displacement between the sending device and the receiving device. And so the first point, these systems are, have been proven to be very, very efficient, 90 to 93 percent efficient from grid to battery. Now, if one looks at conductive charging systems, you might assume they're 100% efficient just because there's a wire there. But in truth, there's sophisticated power electronics in the vehicle that convert the AC grid power to DC power that can be uh, uh, fed to the battery because batteries are charged with DC power. And, and that um, conversion process is similar to the conversion process that happens within a wireless charging system. Um, and so uh, conductive charging systems are maybe at, 
at best 95% efficient and typically much less efficient than that. Um, and so the, uh, the reality is that these systems are, as, um, as Diego said, nearly as efficient, in many cases more efficient than a conductive charging system. Um, this magnetic resonance technology has the ability to handle uh, a very large range of positioning offset, so you don't have to park the car perfectly. And the same ground pad is able to work with vehicles that are range from low ground clearance sports cars all the way up to high ground clearance um, uh, SUVs. The systems can provide just as much power as a, a level one, level two uh, conductive charging system. Um, we see demand from car makers from anywhere from uh, 3.6 kilowatts up to 11 kilowatts as the target charge rate for the vehicles they intend to introduce within the next few years. Um, the system is capable of being deployed uh, flush to the ground or even below the ground or on the ground. The, the paving material has no effect on energy transfer and the presence of uh, snow or ice has no effect whatsoever on uh, energy transfer as well. And this core technology applies to what we call semi-dynamic and dynamic charging, uh, such as um, Stefan described, the Electrion dynamic charging technology utilizes this magnetic resonance in order to achieve high efficiency over a large air gap between the uh, sending coil and the receiving coil. And finally, um, these this technology intrinsically, the coupling between the device sending the power and the device receiving the power, that cup, magnetic coupling is independent of which direction the energy flows. The power electronics themselves need to be adapted to be able to send energy in both directions, but we've proven in, um, in demonstration uh, with together with a, a major car maker, I'll mention this later, um, that the same systems designed for what we call unidirectional charging can be adapted to accomplish a vehicle to grid bidirectional power transfer. Um, the Wytricity technology, as I said, we've been at this for uh, over 12 years. Um, we've built a very large and comprehensive patent portfolio, which we license to companies that are um, interested in creating products for this marketplace. The way in which the technology is being brought to market um, comes both from uh, tier one suppliers who uh, take the Wytricity technology uh, in the form of a reference design and license technology and create products for their specific car maker uh, OEM customers. In general, the car makers prefer that the tier one supplier be the licensee and to, and to do the development, but the car makers do a great deal of validation testing and research and development to ensure that these systems can fit to their vehicle, will be safe and appeal to the, uh, their end customers. The um, ground side of the system, the charger, uh, in the early years, the tier one suppliers who developed the vehicle side were also developing the ground side Increasingly, we see companies who have interest in supplying charging infrastructure, uh, developing the ground side systems only. And it's possible to do that because um, these systems, as Diego mentioned, are being built to global standards. Uh, SAE uh, has very important standards. IEC, ISO are publishing standards in China the standards activity, China, of course, being the world's largest market for cars and for electric cars, um, recently published, they were the first uh, geography in which the standards were actually published, uh, indicating the strong interest in China in this technology. And uh, Underwriters Laboratory has published standards for safety 
And recently, the very first system by one of Whitricity's licensees, an uh, Australian company called Lumen, received the UL certification for distribution in the, uh, uh, with a car maker that's uh, likely to be announced within the next um, several weeks. Um, just a little bit about our company. As I mentioned, we were founded in 2007. We're headquartered in the Boston area. Uh, as we are a spin out from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but we have a global presence. Um, most many of our customers are in Asia, in China, Korea, Japan, as well as in uh, Europe. We have a development center in Switzerland and headquarters uh, development is here in the Boston area. Um, and I won't go through this, but this shows that, you know, electricity has been working aggressively to develop the technology, to develop the standards, and to drive the cost to a point that um, car makers can adopt this, not only for luxury specialty vehicles, but for um, uh, mainstream vehicles as well. It's very important to know that this, the core technology of wireless charging can extend from the use case on the left, uh, residential and home, which we saw in the video, but can extend to public charging use cases, can be designed to deliver higher levels of power for different kinds of commercial vehicles, including buses. Systems have been um, uh, deployed in uh, both uh, Asia, in, in China, and in Korea, and in um, uh, in Europe as well, delivering upwards of 200 kilowatts to charge buses uh, when they are stopped at a different stop. So a similar idea to what Electrion talked about, however, it's not continuously dynamic when the bus stops to pick up people, it receives a charge, thereby uh, allowing the battery size to be reduced and the logistics of charging the bus to be quite transparent to the operator. And there's uh, deployment of, uh, of these systems in taxi queues. Um, the UK has several programs. Oslo in Norway has a program underway to do what we call semi-dynamic, where the vehicles are charged as they move through a queue. The uh, initial system, the, uh, the BMW system was introduced in 2018. Uh, another premium car maker will be introducing uh, a vehicle this year in 2020. Um, and multiple o OEMs around the globe are um, introducing vehicles over the next uh, three to five years. By 2025, we expect there to be quite a few car makers that will have introduced multiple vehicles um, with wireless charging capability built into the vehicle. The use case um, and where these vehicles will be charged, certainly it starts, it starts at home, um, uh, extends to the workplace, but uh, in some countries, people simply don't own uh, private parking garages and um, they, the systems will be deployed in uh, large parking garages and parking lots attached to um, apartment buildings and condominium developments and so on. And then eventually we'll make it into the fully public uh, charging use case. Um, we all know that electric vehicles are coming and coming in a big way. And um, uh, there's, it's expected that there will be over 120 million such vehicles on the road by 2030. Um, and um, as we saw from our previous speaker's presentation, that this charging will primarily occur when the vehicle is not being used, when it's parked overnight, and um, will be charging at a rate between three kilowatts and 11 kilowatts, which charge, what's called level two. And DC fast charging, which has received um, a lot of investment and attention around the world, is quite important, but we'll end up delivering a relatively small percentage of the total energy used for transportation, um, primarily 
as a range extender, if you will, for long trips, as opposed to the primary method of charging a, a, a typical driver's vehicle. So this means there's going to be a lot of chargers deployed in private and public use cases. Um, estimates of over 40 million uh, chargers to be deployed. We aim to make most of them wireless. Um, as the applications mature, we see that concepts for e-mobility extend beyond just the passenger vehicle to different kinds of people moving devices ranging from scooters to buses. And there are a number of efforts underway to do this in a very integrated fashion uh, to provide the best experience, the best energy efficiency, and, and to minimize demands on the electric producers in what are called uh, smart cities. And Watricity is involved with uh, several large car makers on programs that they're investing in to realize this kind of smart city approach. Um, an important element of the smart city approach is certainly going to be autonomous vehicles, which will make up a large portion of the fleet uh, over the next 20 years. And of course, autonomous vehicles, there's nobody there to plug it in. And so the wireless charging is clearly, clearly uh, very critical to the uh, autonomous use case. And here, one moment. I'd just like to show another concept. Um, in fact, what you just saw is not, that was a computer animation, a rendering, but it has in fact been realized in practice by multiple car makers. The integration of auto parking functions, which are likely, are certainly the, the beginning phase of autonomous driving, um, uh, have already, the integration of such systems with wireless charging has already been uh, prototyped and demonstrated and uh, will be a very important use case. I mentioned um, bi-directional energy transfer. So for the vehicle to grid concept in which uh, vehicles act as distributed energy storage, for that to be meaningful, there has to be a large scale. There have to be many vehicles connected. That means it should be easy to connect a vehicle to the grid. Um, and wireless charge, wireless connection to the grid is an excellent way to improve the, num the availability of vehicles with full batteries to be uh, available to be putting energy back to the grid. Whitricity engaged with Honda Research of North America uh, to uh, demonstrate a system capable of wirelessly um, transferring seven kilowatts in both directions at high efficiency. And um, we continue to develop this technology in such a way that it will be compatible with the standards that are being published now for unidirectional charging. Um, so as I said, car makers are very well aligned with this vision of um, adding wireless charging to vehicles. We're engaged with quite a few car makers, many have announced and, and, and shown concepts and uh, announced to the world that th these technologies are coming, in addition to BMW, which has already actually introduced the vehicle. So we like to say that once the technology goes wireless, it stays that way and um, you'll never want to plug in again. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I might have gone a little bit over on time, but I'd be welcome some uh, questions. Thank you, David. Um, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed as well. Um, the company has a long history in, in talk of, of 
even the electric vehicles, but also about uh, the number of patents. Um, it's, it's a huge number, actually. So, uh, following questions for coming up for you. Um, what is the estimation of a wireless system cost for an individual parking position? So I think this is a question that comes from a personal, personal perspective. Um, right, so the car makers have done a fair amount of market research and car makers expect that consumers, um, these numbers are very consistent with what Diego presented that consumers would be willing to spend um, up to a few thousand euros to equip a parking space with wireless charging capability. The cost of installation is very much the same as uh, conductive charging because the installation process is quite similar. Um, the cost of the hardware is a bit higher than for, for a conductive charging system in level one and level two. So there's more electronics content. Um, but the cost range is on the order of uh, uh, 2,000 euros for the charging side. Okay, seems reasonable. Um, next question is referring to um, a standard, the SAE TIRG 2954. Yes. Um, it's currently covers up to 12, uh, um, not 12, 11 kilowatt power transfer rates. What is the state of the standards for high power transfer rates, such as 22 kilowatt, as mentioned? Right, very good question, very timely. Um, so the SAE J2954 standard, which is about to be published, um, it's actually out receiving comments and review as we speak, um, has, will initially be published and cover configurations up to 11 kilowatts. Uh, it's 11 kilowatts taken from the grid. Provisions within the standard exist for going to 22 kilowatts. And the SAE J2954 committee, as its sort of next step, um, will be uh, working to detail the spec and publish um, guidance and specifications for higher power systems, um, uh, certainly up to 22 kilowatts, and then uh, address the topic of standards at higher power levels for commercial vehicles as well. Okay, then it's more a practical question. How do you control alignment between the vehicle receiver and the charger? Is there a guidance for the driver? Um, how does charging power efficiency vary as misalignment increases? Right. It's, um, these systems are designed to deliver, to, to operate in such a way that uh, over the allowed offset range um, of approximately plus or minus 10 centimeters, that the efficiency and power delivery is very uniform. So you don't have to park the vehicle perfectly in order to get the most efficient or the rated charge rate. They, they have a good um, capability to handle a reasonable amount of offset. The vehicle, what uh, car makers have found is that a combination of using front looking um, uh, cameras, which are already exist on the vehicles for just for driver um, auto, not for auto parking, but park assist functions, that front looking cameras develop a very useful image of the ground pad that can help the driver uh, steer the vehicle towards the ground pad. And then we have electromagnetic sensing built into the system that confirms that the vehicle is in a, within the allowed charging range. And that can be used to uh, actively tell the driver when to stop, uh, to slow, 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 stop, uh, based on sensing. And our experience is that um, the, in a very, very high percentage of cases, the first parking approach is successful for uh, high efficiency and full charge rate. Okay. 
There's still questions coming in, so I take a few minutes more. Um, what is the expected lifetime of a system? Does it depend on the usage, amount of energy, power, number of operations? Well, these systems are specified by car makers to last for the you know, life of the car. Um, the number of charge cycles, I, I think I would have to get back and uh, th those specifications are placed on the tier one suppliers, um, but they're, all these systems are intended to last the life of the vehicle without replacement on the vehicle. And that infrastructure systems are specified to have uh, you know, useful life of um, I think 10 to 15 years. So uh, these are capital investment the infrastructure is a capital investment and it has to have a very long life in order to repay the, uh, you know, the initial investment. And I will end with the last question, which interests me, <laughs> which interests me as well. Um, will this inductive charging system make the onboard charging redundant? Um, well, we, our expectation is that, uh, Certainly at the introduction and in the, over the next five years, um, most vehicles with wireless charging will also have the option for plug-in charging, you know, level one, level two. They'll have an onboard charger. And mo almost all vehicles today are also being equipped with uh, um, fast DC charging capability. We expect that, um, over time, the requirement for the onboard charger uh, to plug into the grid should go away. That charging that occurs overnight or at the place of work while the vehicle is parked will be wireless, and, but the vehicle will still have a capability for fast DC charging to extend range um, for long trips and, and so on and so forth. So we would say yes, it, the onboard charger becomes redundant uh, once there's a sufficient uptake of the wireless charging infrastructure. Good, thank you. Um, I have to stop here. Um, some questions popping up, feel free to answer them. Just okay, I'll, typing. during the next speaker, I'll go online and answer some questions. Okay, good indeed. Um, we have our next speaker coming up, uh, Mr. Francois Collet, and he will talk uh, more about um, standardization, correct? Your microphone is still off. Yes. Um, I need to share. There we go. Yeah, there we go. You put it in presentation. Mode. Hello to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, to be the last speaker because uh, all my colleagues make it uh, very easy for me for the for my presentation. I'm I'm from Renault. I'm in charge of uh, the standardization of uh, wireless uh, system. I will speak about uh, two points. The first one will be regarding uh, the standardization what we could expect from uh, standardization uh, and uh, what are the standards uh, which uh, were already presented. Therefore, I will go quite quick what we can find in the standards because there were some questions raised uh, during uh, the first um, uh, presentation regarding that. Uh, one point regarding Europe and the wireless power transfer and a new project regarding dynamic uh, wireless uh, power transfer uh, a little bit in link with the uh, first presentation of Electreon and the next I, as next item I will present a new research project called uh, uh, INCIT EV. Let's start by standardization. So main uh, roles of standardization is to, if we go from uh, the top to, 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 to top center to, to, to in 
clockwise uh, to develop markets help uh, with uh, uh, the strategic choice of the company protects consumers, support public policies, choose your product, so allow to choose your product, transfer new technologies, rationalize production, clarify transactions. So the first message is really standardization is uh, mandatory in order to have a large deployment of, of a system. Then if we look at uh, which standards uh, deal with wireless power transfer, as it was presented, there are uh, three main um, standards that uh, were presented. The first one is historically the SIE one, and then uh, we have the IEC, which is more dealing with uh, the infrastructure side, and finally, the ISO, which is dealing with the vehicle size. What we can say is uh, today, these ISO, IEC, SIE standards have been harmonized, I say, since 2019. It's not true because the standardization, the harmonization has started a lot earlier, but uh, I would say that the last main harmonization uh, meeting um, took place in September last year. And uh, around this uh, wireless power transfer, WPT, uh, we have the communication with the ISO 15118 or the SIEG 2847-6. Uh, and uh, the two communication are quite aligned in, in a lot of, of points. And there is for sure some, 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 some uh, main uh, differences, but uh, some I would say small differences, sorry, not main, but small differences. And now came um, recently uh, China with uh, GB and GBT, which means that is a mandatory um, standard uh, that have been published, uh, like it was presented in April of this year for the first one. Um, I would say regarding the convergence of uh, document to real industrial standards, the SIEG 2944 uh, will be published in August of this year, and uh, I'm part of this uh, standardization uh, group, and it will move from a TIR to the first uh, edition of the standard. And regarding the uh, 61850, uh, which is uh, IEC, uh, they will be published as uh, standard in May or September of next year. Um, what can be found in the standard? Firstly, everything regarding the power transfer. So the power efficiency, which is required to be above 85%, and uh, the call distance, and I put you some uh, information regarding uh, the, what you can find in SIE, but also in the IEC and ISO standards, so the grunt uh, clearance classes that have been uh, defined, and these grunt classes take into account, I would say, from a um, sports car up to, I would say, uh, pickup or trucks, because there is no main differences between uh, pickup and trucks uh, ground clearance. And also the alignment tolerance. We find everything regarding the alignment. By alignment, we speak about the fine positioning of the vehicle in order to park, but also the pairing in order to associate the vehicle with the right um, ground um, uh, coil or uh, ground assembly, and also the alignment check. This uh, alignment pairing and alignment check also uh, implies all the communication. We have everything regarding the vehicle integration, so call position, because depending on the call position of the vehicle, for sure you have some uh, uh, influence on the call position on the ground, uh, but uh, it could be also seen reversely, and also regarding the call size. So in the standards, what you find uh, are always uh, the requirement 
and a lot of test procedure. And finally, we find everything linked to safety, live, uh, like the live object protection and electromagnetic field uh, that are linked together. The foreign object detection, like uh, me mechanical part, I would say, or object uh, staying in between the vehicle and the ground call, and everything regarding electric safety, like uh, uh, electric shock. And uh, for all these requirements, you will find some test procedures in the standard and how to uh, uh, fulfill all the requirements. Regarding Europe and uh, wireless power transfer, uh, first of all, there was um, a commission implementing decision uh, on the standardization request. It's uh, the mandate uh, 533, uh, and uh, the appendix one of uh, this document required SEN and CINELEC to publish by end of last year a uh, first harmonized uh, standard regarding wireless uh, uh, charge. Unfortunately, it was not uh, this, uh, I would say, milestone was not met, and uh, we are on the way in order to have this harmonization, but uh, this harmonization has to also deal with um, another issue which is linked to all the broadcast and the radio amateurs uh, request to uh, meet some requirement of, um, I would say, um, emission level. And uh, a technical meeting will be uh, managed in the 7th of July at 2 p.m. in order to review the test procedure and measure the data, mainly provided by SAE. And, uh, but everybody could join, and uh, so due to the fact that uh, it's open and COPT is also an European organization, everybody is uh, uh, likely to join. Okay. Um, regarding, uh, my final point will be regarding a new dynamic wire pro uh, wireless power transfer standardization project called uh, IEC 63243. Uh, and this uh, new project has started last year, in June last year, and the convener is Professor uh, Uyul Yun from CASE, and the next meeting will be all by Israel in Electreon in October of this year. The standard will have the same technical scope as for static, so it means interoperability and safety, but uh, there is also a proposition to create interoperability testing symposium in the same way as it was performed for the communication ISO 1511-8. Uh, now, coming to the new project, a research project uh, called INCTV. Um, th this project has uh, received funding from the European uh, Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. And it's, uh, eight countries are part of this project, as uh, it's uh, shown on the slide, and there are more than uh, 33 members, so quite a very huge or large project. This project has a, a wide construction, and uh, we can see that, in fact, it was an answer to the goal of user-centric uh, standards, and therefore there are a lot of things regarding the user and stakeholder analysis engagement. We have something regarding uh, everything regarding developers, the technology design and development, technology integration, and everything linked to demonstration enablers. And uh, as uh, you see, there are a lot of location uh, defined in this project. Um, NCTV aims to demonstrate it at five demonstration environments, including TNT corridors, an innovative set of charging infrastructure technologies, and its associated business models. 
ready to improve EV user experience by considering both their conscious and unconscious preference in their design with the ultimate goal of fostering the EV market share in, the year in Europe. Seven use cases have been uh, uh, selected for this project and among these uh, seven use cases, uh, two are uh, directly in regards to dynamic uh, wireless uh, charging uh, system. One is more for uh, charging lane in urban area uh, in Paris and uh, another uh, with uh, a long distance Euro prototype at Satori uh, in the site of uh, Vedicom. And uh, here you have a, a presentation of uh, the work package st uh, structure, which uh, as you see has a lot of things with uh, and focus on uh, user perception, which is a work package too and uh, needs about charging infrastructure and around you have everything regarding the use case and demos, the technologic uh, bricks that will be used in this demo and uh, the tools that are needed in order to perform also the, the demonstration. Regarding the methodology that will be used, you have everything who will start from the user and the stakeholder. Then we have everything linked to preference and specification. And from this point, the project will really go into techniques and uh, then we go to the use case demonstration and then a measurement of uh, uh, the use case in comparison to the expectation from user and stakeholders. Okay, and that's all for my presentation. I'm now uh, will be happy to answer uh, your question if you have uh, any. I'm sure you have. Thank you, Francois. I think you have blown away everyone with your high level information because there is actually no questions for the moment uh, <laughs> here to you. Um, I'm sure that there is interest in the they can probably address it directly to you as well. Um, I think we can decide. I will check once more now. Uh, there's no direct questions for you in, uh, in this case. It's not negative, of course. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. It was really relevant information. Um, if people have questions later, it's not an issue to, to send to, to Philippe an email and we will be pleased to answer later. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you to all our speakers from today. Um, happy that we had them on board, for sure. Um, hope that we can join our, our next upcoming summer webinars, which is next week on the European Alternative Fuel Observatory, a bit more new studies and updates. We have one on the electric vehicle journal. It's specific about scientific data um, that is published in this journal from MDBI. We also have some EVS updates. We are planning a webinar on electric vehicles and fire security. It's a well-discussed topic. Um, Hope to share some insights on this. And then definitely 18 and 19 November, the e-mobility conference or the AEC 2020. Thank you very much. It was happy to see you here on, online. Um, have a nice summer anyway. Keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thanks.